Our scripture this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Now, as you turn there and you're finding that, um, I get asked this question quite a few times, so, so I want to clear it up. I get asked, why is it that every Sunday it seems that the majority of your message is about Jesus' death and resurrection? Well, that is the gospel, folks. It is at the very core. Uh, we are reminded when we read scripture that the Israelites were forgetful people, and we're no better. We are equally as forgetful, right? It's, it's when we come to this table, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He knew we were forgetful people before we were ever born. Now, I, I could come up here and give you a bunch of moralistic messages of to go out, do better, and try harder. But you know what it would do? You would be exhausted. You would exhaust yourself because what we need is to rest in God's hands in his gospel and grace. And now the reason the gospel is preached every Sunday is because some Sundays there's someone here in person with us or online with us that has never heard it in their life. And to give them a message to try harder and do better sends them to hell. Without Jesus Christ, we cannot do better, no matter how hard we try. And so the gospel is at the very foundation of who we are as Christians. It's our very core. And in fact, it's our core of who we are here at First Christian Church of the Beaches. We say we celebrate the gospel. And that's what we do on Sunday. That's why we are here in worship, because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. That's why we are gathered here, because of what God has done through Christ, him dying on the cross and his resurrection. Paul puts it in better words when he writes to the Corinthians in chapter 9, verse 16. He says this, or not verse, in verse 18. No, it's 16. These numbers get littler every year, right? For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no grounds for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So I preach the gospel because that's what God has called me to do. And that is the overriding message of Scripture. The gospel is in every verse, it's in every book, and it's in every chapter. And so as your pastor, I am compelled by Christ, by God himself, to present that to you every week. Because in the gospel, because in this foundation of what Christ has accomplished for you, brings you peace, it brings you comfort, it is the source of our hope, it is what transforms our lives, and in it and it alone can we rest. For there is no other message in all the world that is necessary than that of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let us now read our scripture from Romans 8, verse 3 and 4. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us take a moment and go to him in prayer. O oh, holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. 
So Paul begins this, this eighth chapter of Romans by telling us that, that we have salvation in Jesus Christ. And, and then we have sanctification, this process of being made holy through the, by the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, he points it out that we have been justified, that we've been made right, that we have a ruling of no condemnation over us. And this is the source of our ability to stand and to be bold and unhindered and to have courage, to be able to walk without the fear of condemnation, for we have been ruled, saved, adopted by the God, our Father, Most High. And it's through the Holy Spirit that God gave us that then we have a delight for the life Christ commands of us. It's not this restriction. And that's what Paul is putting down here. He, he's contrasting and comparing what God has done versus what the law can't do. Now, he does point out in several places in the scripture, we're not called to hate the law and to push it away, but Jesus even himself says that he came to fulfill the law. That the law for Christians isn't a means to salvation, but rather once we understand that God has done everything necessary for us and for our salvation, we delight in his law because it is his ways and his will for our life. And so it becomes this love for the law to live it out. It, and there's a difference, right? There's a difference in living in the law to earn your way to salvation and loving and delighting in the law because it brings glory to God. One is very rigid and has sharp edges to it, right? When you try and use the law and to use your own works to get salvation, it becomes very rigid and you become very edgy. I mean, we look in Scripture and we see the Pharisees tried this. Paul himself tried this as a Pharisee that to keep these laws, do all of these things and be perfect. There is no room for error. There is no room for mistakes. There is no mercy. There is no grace in living that way. But there is exhaustion, and eventually it leads to your destruction. But this is what Paul wants to point out. In Christ, you have the ruling of no condemnation. There is no fear that when you trip and you stumble and you mess up, that it's game over. That it's not try hard, do better. But there's grace. There's mercy. See, the law can't give grace and mercy. That's not what it was meant for. But God, in his great love for us, gives us the grace and the mercy that allows us to rest that allows us to know when we do trip and stumble and we mess up. He has not left us. He has not forsaken us. And there is nothing. This is how Paul ends chapter 8. Spoiler alert. That there is nothing in all the world that can condemn you. Even your own failures. If you are in Christ Jesus, your own failures do not condemn you. So you don't have to have the fear of them, but rather the grateful praise for the Lord who forgives, who catches us graciously and lifts us back up and points us back onto the straight and narrow. That we delight in his law because we see when we're outside of it, all of the destruction that comes down upon us and how destructive it is to our own lives and our own bodies and our own families and we delight in his law because we see his ways are the beautiful ways and so Paul here writes this he says that in, in this law he talks about 
is the Mosaic Law. It's the Ten Commandments plus all of the rules, laws, regulations that Moses shared with the people of Israel. That's when, when Paul talks the law here in this section, that's what he's talking about. That you can't just go live the Ten Commandments and be saved. It's not how this works. It's not how any of this works. But rather, the law itself reveals our own sinfulness. It reveals our trespasses. Paul writes, For what the law weakened by flesh could not do. See, the problem with the law isn't that the law is bad. It's not that the law is evil. The law is good. But that we aren't good. We are evil and rebellious. The weakness of the law is that it wasn't designed to redeem fallen, sinful people. It was designed to reveal our rebellion and our sinfulness. The law condemns us for our violation, but it cannot exercise mercy upon us. Only God can do that. For you see, when we're born, we're, we're born in Adam, right? Paul, Paul tells us this clearly in, in Romans. He says we're either in Adam or we're in Christ. One of them is who we stand in, Adam, who holds the original sin. And and so when we're born, we're born into Adam and we stand condemned. And it takes a new birth, a spiritual birth, to come into Christ and be under Christ. And when we are under Christ, we stand under his perfect righteousness. The second Adam, the perfect Adam, the one who came and died and lived so that we would be redeemed. The first Adam led to our destruction. And so, as long as we stay under the first Adam, we too face that same fate. So no matter, even if we keep the law perfectly, it never atones for that sin. So the law can't save us. Paul also points out here in this message, he goes, the law also doesn't make us holy, and it certainly doesn't make us loving and gracious. Right, as, as I talked about in the beginning, if you're living the law as a way to salvation, it's pretty rigid and it's got sharp edges to it. When we read about the Pharisees in Scripture, we don't think, well, there's a very generous and gracious bunch. Right? Their love is very rigid and harsh. In Romans 5, verse 20, Paul writes, Now the law came to increase trespass. He also ends with, So that all the more grace may abound from God. And so here Paul tells us exactly what the law couldn't do. It can't condemn sin in the flesh. And he tells us he did this by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. See, in Jesus, in Jesus, there's no sin to condemn. Jesus lived the perfect life. Scripture tells us he knew no sin. He was without it. And the scripture here tells us likeness, not that he actually put on our sinful flesh and and had sin himself. It was the likeness of our sinful flesh. That way, when he goes to the cross, he can be our substitute, which is what he was. You see, he knew no sin. The son of God lives a perfect life, and yet, He suffered and died on a Roman cross. In the gospel accounts, we are told of the centurion that stands at the cross. And after Jesus' death, he makes two observations that we find in Scripture. The first being that he says, truly, this is the Son of God. His other observation is, truly, this man is innocent. 
So why did he suffer and die? Because God loves you. That's why. And that's why we celebrate. For the scripture tells us in Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. There is, therefore, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. May this be written on your hearts forever. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because God sent Jesus to take care of it all and render us not condemned. Render us adopted sons and daughters of the God most high. Render us loved. For the love of God has rescued us from the very wrath of God. So it's God who through Christ justifies us. It's God, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, who sanctifies us. The law doesn't save us. The law doesn't make us a holy and loving person. It doesn't destroy our rebellion. No, it's the invasion of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that fixes our eyes and our lives upon Jesus to see his righteousness, his sufficient good work on the cross and through his resurrection. The Holy Spirit guides our steps, moves us with grace in process, brings us to delight in the ways of the Lord. The law, when we focus on the law, it keeps our eyes fixed on ourselves and on sin. When you're in Christ Jesus, you stand redeemed. You stand in grace. You stand in the love of God, your Father. Don't forget it. It's what Paul wants to ensure, not just of the Romans, but for us. We're a forgetful bunch, right? And so every Sunday, we come to this table. This table and where Jesus, when he gathered there as he was giving them the bread and the cup, he tells them to do this in remembrance of me doesn't say do it in remembrance of the law that you promise to keep every day here and forevermore. Do this in remembrance of me. And he gives them bread representing his body. It's a sign that signifies his body upon the cross. And then he gives us the cup full of the fruit of the vine, signifying his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And he says, Every time you eat and drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And so daily, not just here at this table, but daily, remember Christ. Fix your eyes upon him 
and you will walk with a newness of life. Because the law tries to transform us from the outside in, that if we follow these rules, maybe my inside will get cooked. What God does through Jesus, his death and his resurrection, is he sends the Holy Spirit into our heart and transforms us at our core and gives us grace for every day forward. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your table this morning, we are so grateful for the good work of Jesus that he is our Lord and our Savior. Help us to find rest and peace and joy in him. Lord, bless this bread and bless this cup. May it nourish our bodies and our souls so that in all we do, we do with a joyful glee to glorify you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For we're told in Scripture it was on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed that he gathered with his disciples at the Passover feast. And there he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave to them saying, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. And in like manner, at the end of the meal, after giving thanks, he took the cup and he raised it up. And he said, this cup represents a new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, do this in remembrance of me.